Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good night, wherever you are on the world. Thank you so much for joining our symposium today on the web. Of course, we're all on the web these days over Zoom, and I pray that you all are safe and healthy. Uh, today, we're talking about something new. I hope this is going to be some new information for you. It's exciting. The world of glaucoma surgery has changed over the last decade, and, and this year we've had more data to support some newer devices and newer technologies. So I hope you're going to enjoy this webinar. It's an international webinar brought to you here by iStar. We appreciate their support. Uh, and I have a group of great panelists with me here. I have with me from France, we have Philippe Denis, uh, who is joining us. We have Julian Garcia Feijo from Spain. And of course, we have Paul Singh from Racine, Wisconsin. So make sure you Google that if you're not sure where it is. Uh, we're going to speak a lot about different types of mixed procedures as we begin the program here. Here's the agenda here. Uh, I will start the program talking about where we stand with MIGS. It's been a long process and where we are these days. We'll talk about, Paul will talk about leveraging the supracellular space, we've been missing it a little bit in the last year and where we're at and what the advantages and disadvantages of that space are. I'll speak specifically about this new device called Miniject and how it accesses the supracellular pathway. Uh, we'll have Philippe Denis speak about the uh, more recent STAR-1 data, uh, which the six month data has been published, but we have more data that he'll be presenting. Julian Fuji will speak about the STAR-2 study, which is a European study also assessing this device, and then I'll speak about some next steps. So those are our agenda programs, we, but this is something that's a bit new, and it's gonna be a little bit uh, thought-provoking because it's new data and new information that many of you have not seen yet. And I know we have people from around the world. I see that many people have joined, uh, hundreds of you already that are on board, and it's great to see everybody here. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we welcome you from our homes and from our offices. So let me first get started. And my topic is gonna to be, where do we stand with MIGS? Um, this has, of course, uh, been a passion for me personally, uh, it's been about, uh, I will say, actually, what, 11 years since the first term of mix came up and popped into my head uh, in terms of why we need a new kind of genre of procedures. Uh, and some things have changed and some things haven't changed. And so I'm going to basically provide this information as far as what I think things are at. Uh, these are my disclosures, and I do, of course, disclose a couple of things. Number one, I work with many different companies, and I realize that there are potential biases in our presentations. We want to be clear that we want to present proper evidence-based medicine, and we want to give you our opinion, uh, which of course will be as, bi as bias-free as possible. My second disclosure is this picture right here, which is a picture of a red eye and a patient on multiple drops. And I'm, I have a clear bias. I'm against this type of picture. So that's my bias that's present here. So of course, the traditional paradigm has involved numerous different pharmacotherapies that are available. We have laser trabeculoplasty, and we have surgical approaches. I think we probably agree that there's a fairly, there's been a fairly large gap that exists in this paradigm between the relatively safer options of medications and lasers and then the more aggressive surgical options that are available. And this is where the whole interventional glaucoma era has come upon us. I think we're in it, we're in the middle of it, we're still kind of figuring it out. But I think the general concepts that I think I've tried to sort of lay out here is that lower is better, earlier is better, safer is better, and we must address adherence appropriately. Uh, and we have to remember that the primary objective is not about IOP, it's not, it's not about a, a number, it's about quality of life, it's about the patient uh, re reported outcomes that we are important to assess. And it's not just the disease quality of life that we're trying to address, we're trying to address and, 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 and address some of the serious issues we have with our medications and our surgical options that can affect quality of life. Let's remember over a patient's lifetime that the disease itself of glaucoma impacts the patient's quality of life very little until the very end stage of the disease. For so many years, it's an asymptomatic disease. It doesn't really impact the patient's quality of life. On the other hand, our medical therapies, uh, our therapies that involve you know, administration of drops, for example, can lead to you know, years and years and years of potential issues that impact quality of life. So it's quite, it's quite difficult, of course, for patients to kind of comprehend this, this problem where we're actually introducing issues that affect the quality of life. And so we must try to address these issues because we know that uh, glaucoma, topical glaucoma therapy impacts vision-related quality of life in many ways, whether it's ocular surface-related, whether it's visual issues, whether it's social issues, these are all problems. And when people have problems with uh, treatment-related quality of life, it really provides a poor satisfaction. And again, like I said, compliance is impacted and social behavior is impacted as well. And we know that compliance and adherence are really critical when it comes to visual field stability. Any therapy, as good as it is, will only be as great if it actually is going into the eye or working, of course. 
And this is the data from SIGIS, just showing again, over time, patients become less compliant, less adherent, and as they become less adherent, the rate of progression uh, and risk increases. And this is again supported by other data, as again, monitored patients here, that when people are less adherent, they progress. So I think we all respect this and understand this problem here. We must address adherence in this new era of interventional glaucoma, addressing medications. We also know from numerous studies that really lower IOP is better, even for earlier cases. And we have, for example, anywhere from 10 to 20% risk reduction per millimeter mercury. So every millimeter mercury does count, especially if we're talking about patients in that quote unquote normal range. We have data from Aegis again, talking about the importance of keeping low pressures. We have data from the Canadian glaucoma study, even for early glaucoma, showing that patients who are lower, for example, 15 or so or lower, typically do better in the long run, even with early glaucoma as well. And also this earlier treatment concept is important, that the effect of what we're providing the patient in preventing vision loss, if it's, if it's adopted early, will prevent that from occurring early in the patient's lifetime. And so earlier is better in these situations here. Now, traditional surgery is powerful. It's powerful. It's our most effective product we have to lower pressure. But of course, we also know that there are numerous issues with traditional filtering surgery. And they can be complicated. And although they're not common necessarily, these rare and serious complications, of course, impact our ability to use this as first-line or early therapy. The intensive, the intensive follow-up is, is a problem. The refractive stimulative changes, blood-related ocular discomfort. And as I said, the rare and serious potential early and long-term complications significantly impact the patient's quality of life. And this is, again, part of why interventional glaucoma is to move to a safer, safer route. Now, the advent of MIGS, again, is really predicated on an adventurinal approach that's minimally traumatic that is safe, that is safe. And that's really been the most important part of MIGS, as well as post-operative follow-up. Now, there are a lot of options in 2020, and, and I think I think I would, I would say that, that it's really a confusing picture out there when you have all the different variety of options that exist in, in our hands in most parts of the world. And this creates, of course, some confusion in terms of, well, which device or which approach is the best approach? This is a paper from ophthalmology glaucoma. And you can see the variety of options available, whether it's traditional approaches or whether it's MIGS approaches, blep forming or non blep forming. And then we have different options in terms of inflow, outflow, and trabecular or supracordial. So it gets a bit confusing here. And we'll just briefly go through some of these different options. So this is one way to classify them based on the outflow target, uh, whether they're conventional, whether they're supraciliar or uvascleral, or whether the approach goes more subconj. And then, again, there are different variety of approaches that, that exist and are present. So conventional surgery, of course, we have the old, we have the trabeculectomies, we have tube shunts that have existed for many years. We know what they can do. We have studies on these now longer term. And then we have new adventurinal approaches that are that are designed, as well as ab external micro shunting as well, that are designed to potentially reduce some of the postoperative intensity. And these procedures, I will say, I think are a step up from traditional surgery in terms of the postop recovery, in terms of the visual recovery, and as well as the ability to minimize hypotony and reduce some of the post-operative interventions that are required. But they still require a blood. And that's why I'm And that's why physiologic outflow, whether it's uvious scleral or trabecular outflow, mm -hmm. is something to consider in terms of how can we improve things. And this is typically what we see with the traditional mixed procedures that are now available. All of these procedures, whether they are cutting, trabeculotomy mm -hmm. approaches, or whether they're cutting approaches, like, like you know, with blades, whether they're dilation approaches or stenting approaches, all are designed to bypass the trabecular meshwork and get aqueous into the conventional outflow system. This, of course, requires uh, access to the collector system. This requires, of course, a patent collector system, which isn't necessarily always there, and also limitations that may exist in terms of downstream resistance that may be unknown and unclear. So they are safe, and I will say that I think that's one thing that we can be really comfortable with, that they're safe. But are they effective enough is what, of course, many people have asked in terms of these procedures uh, and how they fit in the paradigm. This is where, of course, suprachoroidal flow in the gradient is well described and well known. Uh, these procedures are, are, again, something that perhaps can balance the safety efficacy. They're physiologic. They have a large absorptive space. And I know Paul's going to go through some more detail in terms of how they fit and the mechanisms that, uh, that are at play with these procedures. So as we have these procedures, we have to think about MIGS here and think about you know, safety and efficacy. And there's a balance between both these options here. Now, traditionally, there's been a tug of war. We give up safety for efficacy or we give up efficacy for safety. And this is kind of being a tug of war. And our challenge is to try to see if we can try to get both uh, potential here. And this is kind of the holy grail of glaucoma. 
Let's remember one more thing as well. We talk about MIGS differences here and different procedures that it's not just about IOP. For the patient, it's about medication reduction. So when we look at studies, it's important to try to look and see medication, for example, and see what the medication reduction is and how it compares from one procedure to the next, because that from a quality of life perspective, as mentioned earlier, is important. As we think about these procedures and options for glaucoma, let's divide them up between looking at risk on the x-axis and looking at IOP lowering on the y-axis. We know that medications and lasers, quite safe, but IOP lowering is limited. We know for tube shunts and recolectomies and mitomycin procedures that they are very, very effective, but they have higher risk, relatively speaking. Where we want to be is where the star is. That's where we want to be. We want to be really low risk and really effective. And I will say we still don't have that procedure yet. Uh, Tubercular makes kind of fit in that safer option, but not as effective as we'd like them to be. And subconscious makes provides more efficacy, but still has potential side effects that can occur, again, with the mitomycin blend. And this is where the question, the light bulb is in terms of can we fit a procedure in this space that gives us more efficacy, but still maintains the safety uh, of what we try to achieve with mixed procedures. So what's next for MIGS? Well, it's about maximizing efficacy. I think that's where we have to be going. We have to think about how do we improve visualization, improve delivery systems, improve uh, the ability to control wound healing. Drug evolution and combination therapies are going to be interesting and useful. Imaging is important. And can we address the supercellular space again as a viable target? So that's kind of where we are with MIGS and where we stand with MIGS. I wanted to hand it over to Paul Singh, my colleague from, again, from Wisconsin. Paul, tell us more about how can we leverage the Super 30 space effectively? All right. Thank you, Ike. I appreciate the opportunity. To, thank you to iStar for the, uh, as well for being on the panel. Uh, I am Dr. Paul Singh from the Eye Centers of Racine and Kenosha, which is out in Wisconsin here. And I'm trying to see if I have, there we go. For those of you who don't know where Wisconsin is, uh, it is in the middle of the country. And we are known as the dairy state, meaning we're known as cheesehead. So that was a cheesehead that my parents made me to fit over my turban so I would never forget my roots as a Wisconsin native. So we are just below the Canadian border there. And uh, I forgot my disclosure slides, but I do work and I do work with a lot of the companies in the MIG space, including iStar as well. <laughs> but it is it has been a, a, a wonderful time for us as glaucoma specialists. You know, like Ike was uh, eloquently mentioning and describing, there has been a paradigm shift, a philosophical change in our mindset in terms of earlier intervention, that interventional mindset. And I think we, we, when I look back at my practice and, and the past 15 years being out of fellowship, I realized how many patients that I've let go and really avoided surgery because I was fearful of all the risks and complications that are associated with traditional glaucoma surgery. And I look back now and I wonder, wow, if I had had other surgeries early on, I could have saved some of these patients. I think that is the mindset earlier intervention. And also, again, he mentioned quality of life. That is such a big part of my definition of control glaucoma. Many years ago, you know, I, I would just IOP, visual field and optic nerve. And that was all I cared about in terms of control glaucoma definition. But now it's really, is the patient able to sustain their control throughout a long period of time adherence? So that's a big, big issue now. So as I mentioned, how do we get to this earlier intervention mindset? Well, we needed procedures. And that's where the MIGS hallmark was, was safety, right? Is safety was an approach. I think that minimal trauma to the target tissues and that rapid recovery is really important. But at the same time, we needed to have good IOP reduction. That's where that safety, but also efficacy uh, argument is important. And what's exciting about MIGS, I think now, is the it really re, re emphasis and appreciation for mechanism of action. Where are these different products working, whether it's the conventional pathway, we'll talk about the supercilious space, as I've mentioned, the subcon space, and of course, uh, cilio ablative procedures like ECP as well. So we're paying attention now to outflow and what is happening in the outflow space. And we're going to talk more specifically about this new supercilious space again, rather, that's been, uh, we've missed, as, as Ike mentioned. And when you look back actually at the conventional outflow pathway and all the different products that are available, you realize there's a lot of products because there's no perfect solution. And, and part of that issue is the fact that we don't know where the resistance to outflow is. It could be that we have resistance in the, in the TM, can we just bypass that alone? Or is it the canal that's collapsed or the distal channels, are they atrophied or are they collapse as well? And so the problem that we face as a, as a provider deciding what to do is that we don't have that great preoperative diagnostic test that tells us this is where the resistance to outflow is, therefore use this technology or this technique. And that is, I think, the biggest stress that I face when I'm picking a MIGS procedure. And, and so as I showed you this picture earlier, what is beyond the TM? Well, they, as we do know from various data sets, that there's collapse in the Schlem's canal, and it could be at different points of the canal as well. So if you're bypassing TM and there's a collapse in the canal, you may not have the efficacy that we want in that procedure. 
Haiyan Gong has done some great work showing us that in a number of our open angle glaucoma patients that we have complete blockage or herniations that block the ostea into the collector system. And if you look here at a histopathology slide up top, you see a nice, beautiful patent Shums canal in a healthy, or normal person with a nice opening in the collector system. And on the bottom, that red arrow, you see actually a blockage or herniation blocking the ostea of the collector system. So that's where viscodilating procedures and access to the collector channels can help in those cases. We also realized from the many studies, and of course, Murray Johnston and others have done great work with the outflow system. We also realized that the distribution of the collector system is not equal throughout the 360 degrees. And so depending on what procedure and where we're accessing the angle, we may not be accessing the amount of collector system that we need to, to achieve that IOP reduction that we like. And, and lastly, which is I think partly a benefit and partly a, I think a, a, a potential issue, a barrier is this EVP issue, right? The episcleral mm -hmm. venous pressure. What is the pressure in the vessels in the venous system as the uh, aqueous uh, flows out of the eye? Now the benefit of that is it prevents hypotony and which is a safety perspective, but at the same time, it, it creates a floor where it's hard for our conventional pathway outflow makes procedures to go below that middle teens section because of the EVP. And so, you know, with all that, that's where I think the supersolar space really does give us this kind of safety, but yet significant efficacy. And as we'll talk about with this uh, space, and again, this is not a new space. This is a space that has been described for over a decade or a rather century. And what is a space? It's really between the uh, outer wall of the ciliary muscle as well as the inner wall of the sclera. And so the space is actually a, a space that has a negative pressure gradient. In, in fact, Anders Bill does some great uh, work with radio labeled dyes to understand the outflow in the well and realize that this negative pressure gradient can be up to four to six millimeters of mercury lower than the anterior chamber. And there's a lot more surface area of the ciliary body for the aqueous to penetrate through. So the aqueous travels through the ciliary body, the, at the face of the ciliary body, into the interstitium, and then the interstitium of the ciliary body is a main source of resistance that allows fluid to percolate into that supraciliary or supracoroidal space. And that space is a larger potential, so it can handle more volume than the Schlem's canal or the distal channel. So you have the conventional outflow as well as the uveal scleral outflow or the non-conventional pathway. This is not a new concept, though, and you know, Heine in 1905 actually created the first cyclodialysis spatula to create a cyclodialysis, a access point to the supercellular space. You see that, that nice UVM image down below showing this once we get past that main barrier of the ciliary body, if we can disinsert that from the scleral spur, we have access to that large space that's behind. And that space allows us reduction of pressure. And this is a nice video and animation from uh, Keith Barton and his group just showing us when you create that, create, when you separate that uh, ciliary body, from the scleral spur, you have that access right into that space and fluid can therefore travel. And because that space is larger and there's less resistance once you get past the ciliary body, you have more potential for much lower IOPs. And again, there is that natural negative pressure gradient about four to six millimeters of mercury. And as you increase the interocular pressure, you actually increase that, that pressure gradient between the AC and the supraciliary space. So what makes this, I think, a beneficial space is the fact that we can control and create, rather, a cyclodialysis cleft. And if we can control it, we have a significant power to reduce IOP because of that negative pressure gradient. And I think what we're realizing now, and with the side pass that we had, there was a very straightforward space to access using gonio prisms intraocularly, as, as inter interoperatively, and no bleb creation. Again, this idea of getting away from bleb surgery. And I, I think for us as well, for me, you know, even potentially combining this space with outflow as well as well as the um, subcon surgeries, I think is an option too. And because of the lower risk of traditional filtering surgeries, there's a, there's a great potential of the space. And so for me, you know, where, where would this fit in, in, my, in my algorithm? I think this is where the, the, the excitement of the superstore space is, is really the idea of, it's not just for, you know, the advanced patients, you know, because of the relative safety of the space, we can actually now push it more towards the earlier adoption because of the fact that we don't lose TM, we don't, we're not destroying any TM outflow, we can access the TM later on, but also in those patients who let's say have collapse or atrophy of the uh, collector system, we can perform it in patients who've had let's say a previous trap. And so being able to have a larger number of patients, I think is a really important benefit of the super serious space. So what did we learn from the side pass? Well, uh, no doubt, I think a lot of us miss it. I personally miss it. It was a savior for a lot of my patients. Uh, it was an easy, I think, or not easy, but rather a very straightforward learning curve. That learning curve is really impressive and allowed a lot of our surgeons to adopt MIGs because of that. There's a lot more surface area and a landing zone 
for our doctors to actually implant that, that stent. The also, we also realized it was very powerful. We were able to get pressures nice and low. The issue that we did face though, was that there was not a lot of consistency for some doctors in how much of the stent to place in the anterior chamber. The longer or the more the stent was in the AC, the higher risk of corneal endothelial cell loss. We also saw there was some fibrosis that was occurring where some patients would have a spike in pressure later on. So we, we understood that it was powerful, it was efficient surgery, and it was kind of more efficient to access that space. But we wanted to minimize the issues of migrations, of endothelial cell loss, and fibrosis. And the Compass XT trials over the five years data showed us the longer that stent is in the AC, the higher risk of endothelial cell loss. And so this is a video from uh, Stephen Bold that just shows us as he's taking this, this side pass out for issues of, of length, you see that nice dark glob at the end of the stent there. That's kind of fibrotic material. And that fibrotic material is what we're seeing when some of those patients have to be have to have a side pass explanted. And I think that's what we're trying to minimize this risk of fibrosis that can cause a spike in pressure or migration. And so what we need, and I think where the, the mini jet comes in is we need a material that is soft and flexible that have less potential to uh, irritate the endothelial cells of the cornea. Also, I think for surgeon perspective, a marker on the actual stent to allow us more clarity of where to leave it in the anterior chamber to prevent endothelial cell loss, as well as prevent migrations that we did see sometimes very rarely, but with the side pass. And I think one of the most important points that we need is a material that will minimize fibrosis around that, that stent for but obviously migration issues, but also for IOP control, because we did see again in some patients where that stent would close up, you see a significant rise and spike like we had many years ago when the initial clefts were formed, we did find in those earlier studies that once the cleft closed, we had a significant spike in pressure. So I think, again, the power of the supraciliary space is there, no doubt. If we can control it and maintain it in a safe fashion, this is a very, very useful area for us in the future in, in our control of IOP as well. Uh, and so that was just kind of an overview of the supraciliary space and where we're at. And I think because of the COVID virus and then in our new separate and new uh, restrictions here, I'm going to give you a namaste or a satsrikal. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Paul. I want to take a pause and maybe uh, get some panel discussions. We've had some some questions here that have come up, which, uh, which is great to hear. We have a large group of audience members from across the world here with us today. So that's fantastic. Again, please uh, feel free to uh, enter your questions or comments in the bottom. Don't worry about hurting our feelings. Uh, Philippe and Julian and Paul are really tough guys. They don't mind if you ask some tough questions. So that's okay. And I see, I see some of you have already asked some questions. So we're gonna, I'm gonna throw these questions out to everybody here so they hear them. Uh, one of the first questions that has been asked here is per pertains to um, the trabecular outflow mechanism. In that, do we foresee a time? when we may be able to uh, image uh, these patients, evaluate collector channels uh, prior to surgery to determine which patients would be the best candidates for those types of mixed procedures. Um, who wants to tackle that one first? Okay, thank you. Julian, about to do that. <clears throat> Julian please. I'm Julian from Madrid, Spain. So and that's, I think that's a very, very relevant question. So I wish we could do that right now because that, could benefit a lot the, the way we can choose the right patient for our, for the right device. There are some <clears throat> studies uh, out there, and I really believe in the very near future we will we will be able to image. And it's not only a, a question of selecting the patients, but also it will help us to a position or decide where is the, uh, the better position for our dev the regular device. What do you think, uh, Paul? Yeah, I mean, that's the holy grail is, is to figure out which patients need what procedure, what device. And I do agree. I think there's a lot of work right now be, uh, really looking at non-invasive, non rather, diagnostic tools to understand where the resist resistance to outflow is located. And I, I mean, I use, I use my, for me, a surrogate, you know, number of meds. If someone has a lot of medications on board, my assumption is that is the outflow is res restrictions, not just the TM, probably the canal or distal channels, or let's say they failed SLT. But my assumption for a lot of those patients as well is probably the canal or the distal channel. So I will a lot of times combine a viscodilating procedure uh, or a cutting procedure with a stent, let's say, if, if need be. So I think that is really where I'm looking at is, is these clinical pearls uh, 
to decide where the resistance might be and pick an appropriate device. So just maybe related to this, to this point, and there's been a few questions now that have been asked about this in different ways. So for example, uh, talking about side effects uh, of accessing supercellular space and specifically related to hypotony um, and the concern for hypotony for detachment. So let's focus on that a little bit because I think the first thing I often hear colleagues speak about or think about, I should say, when we talk about the supercellular space, they think of hypotony of the traumatic cleft, for example, or they think of cord detachment. So uh, maybe I'll guess Julian, a question about this in terms of the, the side effects and specifically hypotony with the space in your experience. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I have a quite long experience with previous devices using the supracroidal space. And I think obviously hypotony is a risk, but we have learned that there is, I mean, it's not an important risk. So I, I'm not so concerned about hypotony. So uh, obviously also depends on your surgical technique. So you have to try to avoid any lateral movements. Uh, so obviously to, to avoid to create a very big cleft when you're inserting whatever device in, into the supracoroidal space. But with the early results with the mini jet and with the previous results with uh, Cypass and others, I think hypotony is not a big issue, in my opinion. So also we have to move a little bit to the right in terms of the patients who are the best candidates for this kind of surgery. So probably it's a very, um, it's a, it's a very easy difference between those who are candidates or can benefit from trabecular devices or cutting uh, the, the, the trabecular meshwork and supracroidal devices. If you inject a, a mix in the supraciliary space, you may prevent some the risk of hypotony because if you if you do a sacrodialysis, you open very largely uh, the, 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 the space, and of course you have a, it's a very effective to reduce intraocular pressure, and the, the pressure goes down. If you put something in it, and if you make make a very limited uh, limited uh, cleft in, in the uvascular outflow pathway, you may prevent th this risk. Of course, surgery is, uh, is maybe a hard more than science, but uh, I think uh, it's, um, it's a good way to prevent that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think to dovetail off of that real quick, I, you know, I think the issue that we faced, the perception of the cyclodialysis cleft was, it was, it was, all, was the reason why it was so worrisome is because of the fact that earlier attempts were not controlled. We didn't have the ability to consistently create this perfectly sized cleft with a cyclodialysis spatula. And, and all we, a lot of times we would see would be a, a, a iatrogenic or traumatic cyclodialysis cleft, which was, was, was a problem. So yes, hypotony was an issue. And then of course it would close up. And when it closed up, it didn't close up and the pressure didn't slowly rise. It would suddenly spike and the patient would have a pressure of 50 or 60, even higher. And so I think with you know, the side pass, and of course with the mini jack now and other uh, mixed devices that are coming out, we have a much better control of the flow. And the key I think is not just control of flow to preventing hypotony. I think it's also the ability to prevent fibrosis. I think that is really one for me, the big issue. Can we, cons can we consistently control fibrosis so we have consistent long-term, uh, not only safety, but also efficacy maintained. And I think that's where it's this balance of creating enough flow to keep that efficacy going, but also controlling it enough and preventing fibrosis. And that's where I'm sure you're gonna talk more about that <laughs> soon. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, we're gonna move along here and, and, and present this, this procedure and this device. And I think those, those are very good questions that, that were asked. Um, and I think that uh, the clinical evidence, I think, is going to guide us. But I think the speakers have spoken well about what the potential um, advantages are of controlling the access, which is important. Uh, if I can get control of my slides here. Oh, I think we forwarded it there a bit. Um, so what I'm going to speak a bit about is the actual design of this device. I think it's a very intriguing device. I remember when, when Michelle, uh, the CEO, came to me and presented this material. I was, I was very impressed. I, I had had a lot of experience in the super auxiliary space. And for me, the issues were not really hypotony, actually, believe it or not. I was more concerned about how does the body react to intervention in this space? Because the body wants to heal. And I think the work that has been done came out of University of Washington, which is basically this geometrically designed implant. You can see with the design, the surface design, the pores and the throats. Uh, and this tissue material, this medical grade silicone with this design has been found to be antifibrotic. In fact, um, the studies that were done at University of Washington were actually quite consistent 
in terms of uh, the ability to control the way that the body heals. And I think the secret sauce to any of these procedures is going to be to address wound healing, uh, number one, first and foremost. And how do we do that? Well, of course, we can use chemicals like mitomycin C, but ideally we want to stay away from those things because we know the potential risk. So both by material, geometry, design, flexibility, all these things will play a role. You can see the implant here. You can see it's about five and a half millimeters in size. And you can see how the arrangements of these hollow spheres uh, around and through the implant essentially promote biointegration. What we want to do with these procedures are is basically to kind of almost trick the body to basically feel like it's your own part of your own tissue. And when the body feels it's basically, you know, uh, not a foreign body significantly, of course, the tissue reaction encapsulation reduces. These, these pores and, the, and these spheres, basically microspheres and pores, allow for natural drainage to occur. Uh, remember, there's a, there's a negative pressure gradient through the space, uh, and this biointegration doesn't inhibit this from occurring. Think of it like a sponge, basically allowing the, the flow to continuously occur. And it's very different than, for example, what we see for lumen designs, which have a set lumen size where fluid drains through it. This is a very novel way to think about it, uh, a very controlled outflow procedure. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the uh, evidence around biocompatibility is really critical, and there's various ways to look at this. Of course, these are in rabbit eyes, for example, some of these, some of these slides, and histopath, rabbits tend to fibrose quite significantly. And you can see over a six-month six period, uh, the very nice tolerability and the way that the uh, space heals around the implant here, uh, you can see well tolerated. You can see, again, that the minimal amount of inflammatory cells and, you know, you can see that there's basically these fluid spaces that essentially allow for fluid to drain through and lower pressure. And so those are, those are some of the advantages, again, with this material, uh, which I think is a secret uh, part of the procedure itself. So let's just play a video here. Mm -hmm. This is just showing the delivery system. Of course, material can be great. Implant can be designed really well, but of course, it has to be delivered properly. You can see that it's, this implant comes in a flexible sheet. Implant is says five millimeters by one millimeter in size. Notice how flexible and soft it is. This is important when we think about safety as well and about the ability to, for, the, for the device to securely fit within the space. You can see the multi-channels and the matrix of pores that are present here, uh, looking at the microscopic view of it. And notice this green ring. This green ring is important because this green ring is what we use to guide implantation to ensure that the implant is placed adequately in the anterior chamber. I want to make sure that the implant only remains in the anterior chamber for 0.5 millimeters. And by lining up that green ring as it's delivered, it allows it to be properly placed. You can see the shaft is what we use to deliver. The roller wheel retracts uh, in this ergonomic design, and basically we then place the implant adequately in. Like, like anything else, of course, uh, we do need to uh, have a proper gonioscopic view. A uh, small corneal incision is made, uh, and this can be done standalone. Um, again, just a video just to show how we basically place this, this, this flexible uh, sheath present in the anterior chamber. We use the carefully designed bevel, and, and believe me, we, we, we have, we've done the procedures, and this procedure is fairly intuitive to do, as you can see. Um, and once the, once the shaft is placed adequately, the green ring is lined up, as you see there, uh, at the level of the spiral spur, as you see in the, in the drawing here. And then basically the sheath is retracted, allowing the, us to lay the implant and release the implant within that space. Uh, and again, the aqueous then immediately flows through, and this is where the implant is is designed to be placed. Uh, and let's just go to the surgical video here again, just to show uh, what we're basically showing here is the uh, is the delivery system that's present here. Uh, the roller wheel that we use is designed to, once we place the device in the space adequately, we line up the green room, we can retract it. Notice the flexible sheet that's designed here with a, with a curve to allow us to access the space. Um, we can place this again through uh, a clear corneal incision adequately and a gonial lens, of course, is, is necessary uh, for these procedures, as we do for all mixed procedures. Visualization is really important to make sure you can see how nicely we can visualize the implant within the distal end of that sheath. Notice the uh, visible green ring, which is an important, again, landmark to use for adequate placement. Here we'll show some surgical footage. Uh, this is some of our procedures that we've done uh, as part of our trials, and we'll be hearing again from Philippe and Julian with our results. So like, like we've done with other procedures, we use the bevel to access the supraciliary space by gently pushing just posterior to the slidal spur. This disinserts uh, the ciliary body in the area of implantation, and then we gradually push the sheath forward. 
again in the forward motion as we access the space. Once we have placed this further forward, we notice we note the green ring. We line, as you see the green ring is lined up to the spur, and then we can retract the sheet with the rotor wheel, placing the implant again, leaving it where it should be present, you see, in the angle. And you see how little is present in the anterior chamber angle. It's a very small amount. Again, it's soft, so it conforms to the eye. It's not a rigid implant. And that conformation is very important because it follows a natural curvature of the sclera, avoids it from coming up anteriorly up toward the anterior chamber or, or the cornea. And you can see here that the uh, positioning is, has, been has been adequately confirmed, as you see in that presence as well. So just to summarize again with this procedure here, just a couple of things to remember. This is basically a, a supraciliary mixed procedure. It's a next generation procedure uh, as we move forward in this in the space. Uh, it's a blood free procedure, which I think is an advantage, of course, if we, if we can lower pressure and up, of course, and we'll hear about that as well. The star material is what I think is what's important to consider here. Theoretically, certainly, and we'll see clinically on this one, but theoretically, we see the benefit both in terms of the uh, physical science and the clinical science in terms of the material, the way it's designed, the way that the, um, the pores are made, and the biocompatibility of this material is important. It's not very inflammatory in nature. Uh, again, it appears to be well tolerated in animals, uh, and uh, we see that uh, our clinical work, as we're going to be seeing, we now uh, will present our results. So before we get to that, I did want to um, have a chance to take some questions, and again, I appreciate those of you that have, uh, have answered or asked these questions, and I'll, I'll throw them also out to the, uh, to the group as well. Um, and again, please feel free to write them in, in, in the bottom of the, uh, of the page there, of your, of your web page. Um, so let's let's basically go to some questions here, and again, I'll I'll have uh, I'll have uh, Paul, Julian, and Philippe also throw in their thoughts as well. Um, there's some questions about there's been some other materials that have been used in the supraciliary space, uh, for example, polyamide. Um, and do you feel this material uh, will be less likely to cause supraciliary scarring? Uh, that has been seen with other material, and again, the example that was given here was was more rigid polyamide. So maybe some differences with that. What we've seen with polyamide. Anybody want to throw out their thoughts on the difference in material and how it's tolerated in the space? From animal studies, uh, it has been shown that this material is very uh, biocompatible. And I think uh, uh, the interest of this uh, material is to, to inhibit fib fibroblast proliferation and to, uh, uh, to reduce the risk of uh, encapsulation. Uh, around, around the implant. So I think it, is, it seems to be a, a good natural, into brackets, technique to open the, uh, the suprasphery space very smoothly, in a smoothly, uh, uh, smoothly uh, technique. And uh, you say that the, 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 the implant is flexible. And I think it's a, a big advantage because if you put something which is very hard to the sclera, you may induce some... Uh, Anatomic, anatomical changes with this flexible and very smooth uh, mix, I think is it better for the physiology. Yeah, I, I agree. I think besides the material itself, I think the design of the micro pores is also a benefit. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at studies on even tubes, when you have adequate or significant flow right away, you, you will induce more fibroblastic laydown. And so having these micro pores for a slow, diffuse, uh, egress of fluid or aqueous into that space has the potential for less encapsulation, as you mentioned earlier. So I think it's the soft material, the bio biocompatible material with those micro pores that prevents that significant encapsulation. And you're absolutely right, with the hardened material, the polyamide, you know, even people rubbing the eyes, there's a ten chance that it keeps hitting against the endothelium. So having that marker and a soft material with those micro pores, I think, is really what's giving us that safety with the decreased risk of fibroblastic uh, proliferation. I think you've said it, I think you've both said it very well. And I think there's so many different ways to think about tolerability and safety and efficacy. They kind of related in some ways. Material, the design, the rigidity or softness, of course, are all important. The geometry of it all play a role in terms of how well it's tolerated. The hydrostatic forces that emerge from the implant and how well they're diffused in the space. All of these, as we see in any space, we're draining into in the body. But again, also the supraciliary space are important. So. I think we, you know, this design of implants has, has been uh, in done such a way to optimize, I think, outflow without some of the potential risks uh, in other options as well. So that's kind of what, what, uh, what, what the idea is here. Uh, there's been a question here. Someone asked, and then we'll move forward. Just 
Uh, early studies uh, suggest increased outflow with thinner and younger scleras and less outflow with thicker and older scleras. Does this factor into patient selection? So I don't know if anybody wants to take that, take that comment, is that there's a sclera characteristics, thickness, rigidity, age, uh, play a role in, in the ability for these procedures to work in outflow. So I, I, I can I can make make a few comments. So first of all, I think that there's a lot lot to think about when it comes to uh, sclera and the role of uvus scleral outflow. We know when we think about the uvus scleral outflow pathway that the uvus scleral plexus and the and the sclera all play a role. Uh, the uvus scleral outflow is probably not as well defined as we 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 may think it is in terms of where it ends up going. Number one. Uh, number two, I would say that um, you know I think that uh, we don't really have any, I don't think we have any clear evidence that one makes a difference to the other. There's so many different variables, including, of course, uh, infl inflammation and, and immunological factors. And number three, I think that the variability in thickness, generally speaking, is, is, is not really that large. Of course, we, we're not doing these procedures in nanothalmic eyes and really thick scleras, mind you, to really compare them. We probably wouldn't. So I think for average eyes, I think it's not, I don't think it's a major consideration from what we know thus far, from what I have seen. I don't know, Paul, if you want to add a comment, and then we can move to our next talk. Yeah, it just an interesting uh, you know, comment where, where when the SIFAS was around, we were actually starting doing some studies using coronal hysteresis and seeing if that had a relationship with, you know, potential for, let's say, hypotony, you know, very, very, uh, let's say, low hysteresis, more rigid eyes that have the inability to absorb and disperse energy, would that have a higher risk of, of hypotony? We had some correlations that we were looking at. So I think, interestingly, going forward, that would be a nice thought to look at hysteresis as a surrogate for the ability to absorb and disperse the energy in relation to these devices. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a valid point, actually. You're right, especially the, the myopic eye, perhaps more so in that, in, that, in that situation here, as you mentioned. So I think that uh, there's, there's certainly a lot more work we need to do to kind of understand that more. But for the most range, most of the range of patients that we've been seeing, I think they're fairly, fairly consistent on average. And we try to be careful, of course, working in extremes, whether they're really small eyes or very long eyes, we would just say we should be mindful of that. Well, listen, I think we all want to hear about the results. So we're going to ask uh, Philippe if you could uh, maybe run us through the STAR-1 trial and the methods and the results. So thank you, Philippe, for being here. We, we published the, the six months result in a recent issue of Ophthalmology Glaucoma Journal on uh, the two-year result were in good line and consistent with the six months result with a sustained IOP reduction between six months and two years. There is no trend of reduced efficacy between six, six months and uh, uh, two years. So in summary, I would like to say that this, this first 24 months, first in humans trial, met the, uh, the primary endpoint of significantly, significantly lowering IUP at six months compared to baseline. The results of this study demonstrate that mini jet glaucoma drainage system lowers IOP by approximately 40% after two years and eliminates the need for medication in nearly 50% uh, of the panel after two years when implanted in a standalone procedure. In this pilot study, we, we didn't observe any serious ocular adverse events or no eye required a uh, secondary surgical procedure for glaucoma. So it's very encouraging. And I think that the, the, the star material uh, causes minimal inflammation response. And maybe one of the reasons why we observe these encouraging outcomes, and I hope that this, this outcome will be sustained in the longer term. Thank you so much, Philippe. Uh for the uh, presentation uh, and reviewing these results. You know, the publication uh, is out there, as you mentioned, and we're looking forward to seeing 24 months published as well. And thank you for just summarizing some pilot, some early results that we've seen. Um, so I think what we'll do is uh, we're gonna maybe go to uh, Julian to present the STAR-2 results. Uh, and then we can maybe come back and talk a bit about some of the questions that have come up. I think that there's some good questions to ask as well. So Julian, if you could, uh, prepare and tell us about the STAR-2 results which is the European trial now uh, and some of the early findings. Thank you, Julian, for being here. Right, thank you, Ike. Well, thank you again, everybody. So, well, I think that it's been, it's been clear, very clear now that um, when dealing with the suprachoroidal space, well, one is power with control. So 
power comes from the potential of the supracroidal space itself. And control is supposed to be provided by the material of the of the mini jet. So you've seen the results of the star, the star one. And basically the idea with the this star two trial is to confirm the results of the of the previous one in terms of safety and let's see. Uh, safety and um, IOP reduction. So, in summary, so there is a reduction in the IOP and the medication is very clear. 40% um, reduction after six months, and you've seen the difference between even the, the reduction is uh, higher in the cases in the case of patients that were on no extra med, the pressure went down to 12. No major safety control uh, regarding the corneal endothelial hypotony. There were no changes or no displacement of the of the mini jet. So I think it's fair to say that it's a it's a good blood free procedure. We still we just know this uh, six month data. So obviously we need more uh, longer time. Uh, term data, but it has the potential to be beneficial for not only patients with moderate, but may, maybe a little bit more advanced glaucoma. Thank you, Ike. Thank you so much, Julian. Uh, and I appreciate the, uh, the discussion here. And we've had some good questions. Um, we're, we're, we are more toward the end of our formal slide set. So I wanted to maybe just get to some questions and I can, of course, talk about the next steps here. But I think what a lot of the audience wanted to ask uh, pertain to the presentations we've heard about already. Uh, both Philippe and you have presented uh, some early results and then some longer term results with the uh, Miniject, both uh, internationally as well as in Europe as well. Uh, I think it's encouraging. I will, of course, uh, you know, again, as the audience knows, these are early studies right now. We are encouraged by them and we're looking forward to seeing uh, and we'll talk a bit about next steps later on. Um, so some questions I want to ask to uh, Philippe, to Paul, to Julian that have come up here um, pertain to endothelial cell loss, because this is a concern that came with regards to, uh, to the side pass. Um, do you think that it was the rigidity of the material that caused the cell loss, or was it the length of the, of the stent into the AC? That's one part of it. And the second part of it is, uh, what about the risk of iris structures or sneakia growing over the implant? Uh, if the implant is close, is so close to the spur, meaning 0.5 millimeters. So two questions. One pertains to the reason for cell loss with side pass, uh, length or, or material, rigidity. Uh, and second part of it is, well, if you're placing the miniject deeper in the AC, like 0.5 millimeters, is there a risk of syndicate formation? So I'm not sure who wants to uh, take that, those questions. Uh, maybe yeah. okay. uh, we can have, okay, go ahead, Philippe. Oh, as Julian uh, say. <laughs> There is no implant migration. So if you put the, 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 the implant right in, in a good place, it doesn't move. Um, we have learned with the side pass that the risk of uh, corneal edema and corneal damage was directly related to the number of rings which, were, which was in the, the anterior chamber. If, they, if you put the, 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 the mini jack implant in the right position with, because there is no implant migration, there is no risk of, uh, of uh, corneal touch or corneal inflammation, which it may induce some uh, uh, ECD loss. So it's very different. And uh, w w with a side pass, because it's very, very rigid, maybe it's not possible to put the, the implant right in, right in the place. Paul, and, uh, any thoughts on these questions uh, uh, pertaining to, uh, to the, the differences and uh, sinicia formation, cell loss? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think it's, it's no doubt, as, as Philippe mentioned, it was, it was related to length, number of rings. The question that comes up is, is if you had a softer material and you had that same length, would you have the same endothelial cell loss? So to answer the question of the material, you'd have to have you know, the same length and have two different materials and see what happened. But I do think it's a combination. I think it's no doubt the, more, the longer it is in the AC, the more potential it has to irritate the endothelium, whether it's rubbing or not. But I think that, that, that non-flexible polyadmine material did allow more potential for it to rub against the corneal endothelium. So I think it's a combination of the material as well, of course, as the length of the eye. And as, as Philippe mentioned earlier with the animal studies, there is uh, definitely a decreased risk of, or decreased uh, formation 
of infl inflammation and uh, fibroblastic growth. So I do think that the you know as long as you have enough space between the uh, scleral spur and the and the, the tip of the scent, I don't think you're going to see significant PS formation. And we'll have to wait and see, of course. But that's my thought. Good, Julian. Anything to add to that comment? Well, I fully agree. So it's rigidity and the length of the device in the anterior chamber. So I published a couple of years ago my thoughts on this regarding the SIPA. So it's very, I think it's very clear. And there is, a clear, again, a very clear difference between the uh, SIPAS material and its rigidity and the soft material of the mini jet. And I've shown you the UVM images before, so it's very clear. I, I agree. So a couple of my comments on this. I, I think that it's it's easy to kind of put all the super procedures into one bucket because of the experience with one device. Uh, but like any procedure we're doing, a lot of it is dependent on the device itself, how it's placed, surgical technique, the design as we heard, the material, uh, everything else that plays a role in this. And I think that from everything I've seen, and to be fair, we, we have two-year data, so we're looking forward to longer-term data to support these conclusions. But from what we've heard so far and what we've seen so far with the flexibility of the device, the way it's placed in the anterior chamber, the way it conforms, uh, there was a question about migration again or compression. I think that, you know, although although it is flexible, it does conform and it does have its own, you know, capacity. Uh, and I think that really just ensures that it doesn't, you know, get blocked or potentially limit flow. Um, I think all of these, I think, improve the, the reliability and improve the safety of the procedure, which is what we're really after here. In terms of the deeper pla deeper placement than what we uh, than what we're talking about, 0.5 millimeters, I think that um, you know uh, 0.5. I think it seems to be reasonable enough. We have two year data now to support that the implant is, is well positioned and well tolerated. Uh, I think that of course we are doing them in eyes that have open angle glaucoma. I would uh, I would just again caution that this is the kind of eye we studied. We don't know how it will perform in angle closure. Uh, most mixed procedures are not designed for angle closure, so I want to be careful before we jump to those. But I think in average anterior chamber depths, uh, 0.5 millimeters is, is well clear. Uh, 0.5 is, is, is quite reasonable. And it does, again, conform to the sclera. So it does uh, allow itself to kind of position itself between the iris and the, and the cornea. So that's uh, what what I would say to that, to that question, which is a good question. Some questions here that pertain to, is there a, a best clock hour to position the implant? Do you feel the implant should be positioned at a certain clock hour to improve efficacy or as a questioner was asking um, in terms of rubbing of the eye should it be in the superior quadrant to avoid potential issues any thoughts given to this in terms of safety or efficacy in terms of where the best position for this implant is in the supercellular space hmm. well i think you know when you implant it um you know, try to avoid three and nine just uh, as much as possible because of the, the vascular plexus. So from a heme reflux, I think that's uh, probably, to me, the most important issue. I, I don't know really if there's any significant benefit of going superior uh, nasal or inferior nasal, but I think that vascular plexus is all I'd probably be more concerned about. Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to trabecular outflow and trabecular stents, we, we have some thoughts that, of course, the episcleral veins, which are variable in everyone's eye, the proximity of placing a stent near an episcleral vein or an aqueous vein is likely to be helpful because the resistance is lower in that vein. But because supercellular space is a large resorptive space, the positioning shouldn't really matter where it's positioned in terms of efficacy. In terms of safety and things, again, I think because it's such a soft implant, I think that it, because it conforms nicely with the globe, I think that the risks are minimized in terms of even with eye rubbing. Although I think, I think in general, we know that eye rubbing is just generally not a good idea even in normal patients without treatment without having surgery so but i don't i think that that minimizes uh, the concern of the risk um there's a question here uh that um has to do with multiple devices um could they be implanted in the same eye we've done that of course with other uh other mixed devices um thoughts on this would you consider doing multiple devices at the same time or sequentially anybody thought about this in this area well I, my my only concern with that is that um, I think when you implant something super into the supracoroidal space, you're in a sense priming the space. So probably that's my feeling. So I, I don't have hard data to show. But if you do multiple implants, probably the success rate will be lower and lower. So I don't know your thoughts, but uh, 
Uh, uh, yeah, the question is, you know, are you maxing out if you have good outflow through your one, uh, let's say, mini jack? Do you uh, need a second one to max to increase the outflow? And I'm not sure if that would be a truism or not. You know, I think one would be enough if it's flowing well to maximize outflow through that the space because of the negative pressure gradient. The question comes up is, you know, do you want to do something in the, in the TM as well at the same time? And do you want to combine different mechanisms? But I think from my perspective, I think I would be comfortable just performing one and then waiting and seeing after that. And if you do a multiple intervention with several uh, mix, you have the risk to narrow the barrier between efficacy and safety. Because if you do, if, if you, you, you do more, uh, more surgery, you have the risk to have a, a chronic hypotony. And you, after that, you, you won't be able to solve the problem because you won't know which mix is involved in, in the hypotony. Yeah, you know, just but, a quick comment on, like, on um, the, the, the power of the, of the IOP reduction. I mean, back to uh, Philippe and Julian, Julian's presentations. I mean, th these were not non-washed out. These were, these were not washed out. So these are patients on medications at a pressure of 24, 25. So when we look at all the different MIG studies, they're all washed out, like you mentioned earlier. So that's pretty powerful. On meds, non-washed out from 24 down to 14, and the 50% of the patients off of medications. And that's a significant power that we don't see with other conventional outflow MIGs procedures. Yeah, I think that's a really good call out uh, on the studies in terms of comparing them. These, these patients were, were, were not well controlled. Uh, these weren't patients who were controlled on medications, washed out, and then done. So that's, again, further emphasizes the importance and the results in terms of efficacy. Um, I, I think that the multi-implant one is an interesting one. I don't think theoretically is necessary because, again, once we access the supercellular space, we can access the entire space, uh, certainly, and the result the capacity of it. Um, I think that Philippe is probably right that I don't think we need to put more than one in at one time. Uh, so I don't think that's something that is necessary the theoretically either. And then doing it sequentially, uh, as kind of Julian said, I think once you kind of access one outflow pathway and, it, and if, it, if it didn't work, then I don't know if I would want to uh, achieve that um, the same way. Uh, I, we may want to go to another alternative pathway as well. So that's a question that uh, is, a, is a good one there. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next step because I know that we're, uh, we're kind of toward the end of our webinar. And I know that uh, uh, Philippe uh, probably has to leave because he's uh, such a busy guy in France doing great work. So thank you for being here, Philippe. If you can stick around, we'll see you. Otherwise, thank you for being here. I want to go to the next steps and just speak about what's happening with the design, because of course we've seen some of the early results with the star one and star two. If I can go to my next slide, uh, I want to share, I want to just share, share with you that, um, that uh, currently there are a few uh, projects underway that uh, it looks like um, in the European market, at least uh, the CE approval is on track for 2021. Uh, there's um, a regulatory program present in the US that uh, will commence uh, soon um, and uh, will we'll, we'll then give us and inform us, of course, with important data uh, for approval. And I think this will continue to expand uh, its uses. One of the things that's important to remember with this device is the data that we've shared so far have been without cataract surgery. So the confounding effect of cataract is, is not uh, present in looking at the results. On, this, on the same time, we know that there's certainly a reasonable, uh, re reasonable opportunity to potentially combine it with cataract surgery, and so we need to have more data uh, to, uh, to look at this uh, course in the future. So let me just summarize here, just as we conclude here, we've talked about where do we stand with MIGS. MIGS, of course, is predicated on safety. Different pathways have different safety parameters, and different pathways have different efficacy, and our goal is to maintain high safety, prioritizing, prioritizing this, but uh, trying to achieve perhaps more efficacy. Paul very nicely talked about some of the differences in the physiologic outflow between trabecular conventional and supercellular uveus sterol, and taking advantage of the negative pressure gradient, the large space uh, that can be designed with these procedures uh, to take advantage of this outflow track as well. But we need to consider when we use this space that we need to control for fibrosis and wound healing, like any space, of course, but again, pertain to this space as well. I spoke a bit about the star material and the benefit of this design is biocompatibility. Uh, it's reduction of inflammation and, and encapsulation that may occur. Uh, the delivery of the device itself that can be uh, performed here surgically with an adventurial blood free approach. And then we appreciate Philippe and Julian speaking about the star one and star two results again. I, I would say they're promising results. We need, of course, longer term and bigger data sets uh, to give us and inform us more on where this fits. Um, the efficacy certainly seems to be uh, very, very good. 
uh, and uh, with, again, significant medication reduction, IP reduction, particularly patients, again, who were pretty high pre-op already on medications, as Paul alluded to. Uh, thus far, we have not seen concerns around endothelial cell density loss, which, again, is something now that we have, uh, you know, thought about, um, of course, for, for these procedures uh, that we uh, will need to consider and prioritize safety. So that's uh, some good promising results. I think that uh, what we hope to see, of course, with this device is a, is a new procedure, a novel procedure, novel device material that can provide safe and effective pressure lowering and, and fill that gap and that void. I, I think there's an opportunity uh, for a lot of these mixed procedures to be used. And remember, a patient's lifetime, in a patient's lifetime, they will require multiple therapies, multiple drops, lasers, uh, one or two different mixed procedures, uh, a subcons procedure, something more traditional, maybe a tube. I mean, we need to consider, of course, the long-term control of the patient's pressure. Uh, and we may need to use multiple different ways to do this. And the ability to do this, again, with different outflow uh, the targets is important to consider. So we're excited about uh, revisiting the super space. space. Uh, we're excited about the data that's going to come forward. And again, we encourage you all to uh, keep a close watch on this. Uh, the 24-month data uh, is being submitted for publication uh, very soon. And we'll be seeing that data published, and you'll be able to read those papers as well. So uh, thank you. I we weren't able to get through all the questions here. Um, I think that there's some good thoughts that came through here. I appreciate everybody listening in. Uh, stay tuned. Um, we'll be seeing you at more webinars, uh, of course. Uh, throughout the <laughs> I hope that we get back to work soon uh, and get back to taking care of our patients. For those of you that are still not uh, seeing patients regularly, always good to see you guys. Have a good morning or a good afternoon or a good night wherever you are, <laughs> and peace and love to everybody. Stay secure and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you for iStar for allowing us to present your results, and uh, we appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Gracias. Thanks Thank you. a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.